Welcome back to Mayo Clinic Radio. I'm Dr. Tom Shives. And I'm Tracy McRae. June is Men's Health Month, finally. Oh, good. The purpose of Men's Health Month is to raise <laughs> awareness of preventable health problems and to encourage early detection and treatment for men and boys. Now, that's a really good idea. Here are some facts from the CDC that you may not understand or okay. may not know. Okay. Women are 100% more likely to visit the doctor for annual examinations and preventive services than are men. Does that surprise you? Not a bit. Probably not. Now, in 1920, women lived on average one year longer than men. But now, men on average die almost five years earlier than women. I don't know what happened. No comment. No (laughs) comment from me. It's not an exaggeration to say that, on average, men live sicker and die younger than American women. Men need help. That's right. We live sicker and die younger. (laughs) We need Men's Health Month. You're right. Joining us in studio to talk about one of many men's health issues, the prostate gland, is Dr. Mitch Humphreys from Mayo Clinic in Arizona. Welcome back to the program. Thank you so much for having me. It's great to be back. Dr. Mitch Humphreys, always good to have you on the program. Welcome to Rochester. A little warm in Arizona this time of year? It's starting to get a little bit toasty down there. (laughs) (laughs) So what advice would a world-class urologist have for American men? So one of the things that I would tell men is that a lot of times as men get older, they find that they're not peeing as well, mostly because they say, well, it's just age. I'm just not peeing as well. So... This is normal. My dad did it. My grandfather did it. I get old. You know, my going to the bathroom with my grandson, he's done in two minutes and I'm still standing there five minutes later. And so they equate that as the normal process of aging. It's not really the normal process of aging. What it's signifying is as the prostate gets bigger, it causes obstruction. And one of the slow urinary streams may be that first symptom that most men detect in that. They also get up more at night to urinate. There's several reasons for that. Um, one of the most important ones is a lot of times men get nocturia, and it's a, that just means getting up more at night to go to the bathroom. Okay. And the reason for that is is sometimes, especially in men that may have other health problems like sleep apnea, you wouldn't think of sleep apnea causing problems with urination. That's where you kind of hold your breath at night when you sleep. But when you snore and you sleep, that right side of the heart gets dilated. And then what happens, the heart sends a message to your kidneys and says, this person's got too much fluid on board. You need to make more urine and get the urine out. Um, and so men get up more at night to, sl- to urinate. They don't get as good a night rest, and it's indicative of what's going on with their heart. And the heart can get stretched, and it can cause problems. So what I would tell men, the take-home message from that is don't ignore your urinary system. It may be kind of your early warning system that something's going on that you need to fix, whether it's in your lower urinary tract with your prostate or it could be reflective of your heart and how you're sleeping and other things. So it's important to pay attention. So we needed a prostate gland to reproduce at at one time. Don't need it anymore. It's a useless organ. But why does it get bigger as men age? So the prostate is just a gland, and it's one of those glands that's responsive to hormones. So the more the prostate is um, exposed to testosterone over over your life, the more it will grow. Basically, the prostate takes testosterone and it converts it into dihydroepitestosterone, which is a fancy way of just how it handles the hormone to grow. As it grows, it gets bigger. And the size itself doesn't really mean much, except where that size impacts the urinary channel. So if it gets bigger on the outside, that's a problem. But if it gets bigger on the inside to occlude the urinary channel, that's a problem. I like to describe the prostate as an orange. An orange peel, the outer part of the orange, that's where prostate cancer grows and then the meat of the orange. And men pee through the middle of the meat of that orange like peeing through a donut hole. And if that donut hole gets smaller and smaller because the prostate's getting bigger, that creates some of the urinary problems that they have. There are certain men who are more likely to develop a BPH or benign mm-hmm. prostatic hypertrophy, enlargement of the prostate, than others. Is it Does it run in families? It, there's a, certainly a family uh, risk with it, so it definitely runs in families. Um, There's also a bunch of theories about certain environmental exposures, certain lifestyle things of things that you may eat or ingest or be exposed to in your career. Um, But usually it does run in families. But part of it is men are just living longer. And we may be sicker and dying younger, but we're living longer than we were uh, back when we uh, emerged from the oceans. So based on that, the prostate gets bigger over time, and it certainly does cause problems. The other thing that we're seeing now is prostates are getting bigger because as a first symptom of those urinary symptoms, 
primary care physicians and men's health providers are providing medications, which is an easy answer to help alleviate those symptoms. That doesn't always shrink the prostate. So the symptoms may be getting better, but the prostate keeps growing bigger and bigger. I want to go back to something you said initially when we got started and that you thought, well, my dad took him longer to go to the bathroom, my grandpa. Are you telling me that men really do have these conversations with the other men in their lives to find out that, oh, it's normal what's happening? Uh, taking longer to go to the bathroom is a normal part of aging. Are, are men, I, that surprised me when you said that. I really thought this would be something that men would be kind of suffering on their own and wouldn't talk to other people about it. Just like but most things, we suffer uh, on our own. Any, of the, other to the to any of the other topics that we <laughs> talk about, that's one of the, the problems for men. Yeah, and I think that they do suffer, but what you got to look at is the bathroom situation for men is totally different. We all have urinals. So when you go to a restaurant or if you go to a sports event or if you go to an airport and you're urinating next to somebody else, you know who takes longer uh -huh. to urinate. And so it it elevates what they're seeing in terms of their life. I find that the most men have this conversation from what I hear is on the golf course. Hmm. It's all about how many times they have to go to the bathroom before the turn. Mr. Golfer. Uh, That's so. right. And, okay. and, you know, we're not in a stall. We know what the, the guy next door you know, is, is doing. Yeah. That, makes a great, that makes a great point. So then you, you see that it is changing. And then do they come and see you? Or are they just talking amongst each other going, yeah, this sucks to get old? So it's, it's actually really interesting. We did a study looking at trends in surgical treatment of BPH. Um, and what we did is we took all the men that had had BPH and we tracked where they are from um, for a specialized procedure we do for BPH. And I thought, well, all these patients that I'm operating on, they, uh, there's certain physicians that just keep sending them in over and over. But when we looked at it, it was a viral spread that just made the country just kind of start turning red where they when we first started doing this procedure back uh, over a decade ago, about 65% of my patients came from Arizona. Now in 2018, only about 22% of my patients come from Arizona. The rest come from all over the country and all over the world for this procedure we do for BPH. And my largest referral source is patients sending patients. And that's unique in a disease, right? So usually it's physicians sending patients in, referring them in, but this procedure is a little bit specialized and it's the patients and one man may have one surgical treatment, one man may have another surgical treatment, another, and then they're all peeing on the golf course, they're all talking about it, and they're like, I want to pee like he did. And I want to be able to write my name in the snow again, or the sand, depending on where you're from. If you're yeah. playing golf in the snow, uh, yeah. you are golfing in the wrong spot. Uh, it's Minnesota golf. <laughs> Before we talk about uh, treatment options, and in particular the one that, that you specialize in, I want to ask you about uh, what happens if this goes untreated? Aren't there some potential complications if you don't either get medication or, or surgery? What? Yeah, so, so what's interesting is there are certain complications where we say surgery absolutely isn't necessary where you can't urinate anymore. Your kidneys can start to fail because they can't get the urine out anymore. You start to get infections. You start to get stones in your bladder from the signs of not being able to get those, um, get the urine out. And in the United States, the real death mortality of BPH is pretty much a historical disease because patients seek treatment before they get to that end stage and it's treated with medication or they're referred on. I also do uh, surgical mission work in Haiti where it's different. The same disease of BPH, men are dying because their prostates get so big and they can't pee. Um, so they get a catheter, but they don't have the resources to get more than one catheter, so they die from infection. Or they can't pee and the kidneys start to fail and they don't have access to dialysis. So in the United States, it's more of a disease of convenience and um, other more austere parts of the world, it's more of a disease that can be lethal. All right, before we talk about uh, treatment, we, we do need to take a short break, but I want to ask you quickly about diagnosis. Is this a diagnosis that you make by history and rectal exam, or are there other tests that you need? So we do start with history and rectal exam to kind of gauge the symptoms, and we have what we call a severity score, either an AUA symptom score or an international American prostate. American Urological Association. Yep, yep, American Urologic Symptom Score or International Prostate Symptom Score where it looks at several domains of how they're urinating, and we can use that to grade kind of where they are in the treatment paradigm. Once we have that, we do other tests, such as a Euroflow, where men pee into a bucket. We see how fast the flow is going. We put an ultrasound on the stomach to see how much they're actually emptying their bladder. Um, we may do something called a cystoscopy, which is putting a teeny tiny telescope 
through the penis to actually determine the morphology or what that prostate looks like from an anatomic standpoint. Because not all prostates are the same. They come in different shapes, configurations, and certain treatments won't work for certain prostates. Um, and then sometimes we do an ultrasound of the prostate to get an idea of the size because certain procedures and technologies are only good for small prostates. Others are better for big prostates. What we've learned is it's not one size fits all. You have to treat the individual and the individual prostate. So all of those things will help you decide on a treatment regimen that's appropriate for the individual. Correct. All right. Our guest is an expert on men's health and the prostate gland, Mayo Clinic urologist Dr. Mitch Humphreys from the Mayo Clinic in Arizona. Time for a short break. When we come back, we'll talk about treatment options, including the HOLA procedure. Okay. <laughs> Welcome back to Mayo Clinic Radio. I'm Dr. Tom Shives. And I'm Tracy McRae. We are with urologist Dr. Mitchell Humphreys from the Mayo Clinic in Arizona, who is in Rochester visiting and in our studio. We've talked about the uh, enlargement of the prostate. Every man's prostate tends to enlarge. We've talked about how you make the diagnosis. And now we want to talk about treatment options. And I think there are basically two, medication and surgery. So how do you, how do you start and how do you decide? So it's all based on the severity of the symptoms for the patient. So if they say, boy, this is really bothering me, or if they say, this isn't that much of an issue, I'm okay, I can live like this, as long as we do an assessment and we make sure they're not doing any damage to either their kidneys, their bladder, or overall, then we're okay. There are absolute indications for surgery that I alluded to before, is if they can't urinate, if the kidney function is starting to be affected, if they're developing bladder stones, or sometimes the prostates get so big, just like you get varicose veins on your leg, you can run into bleeding situations. And once you start to get bleeding from the prostate to fix that so that you don't have any more bleeding, sometimes we advocate treatment in those situations as well. So a lot of it's based on the symptoms of the patient as well as the medical need for what guides our next steps in terms of treatment. Do the medications work pretty well and do they have side effects? So the medications do work very well. There's a host of different medications, um, and we can get into the classes. They do have side effects from them. Um, the biggest side effect that men complain about from the, side of, from the profile of the medications is what's called retrograde ejaculation. So instead of um, during sexual intercourse, instead of the semen coming out of the tip of the penis, it will go backwards in the bladder because the prostate is relaxed. Um, some men do not like that feeling. Um, most women prefer that feeling. Uh, so uh, some of the medications as well will have side effects where they get she lightheaded. Said, Honey, why don't you get on that medication? Oh, my well, gosh. I have, I have had wives come in afterwards for their follow-up checkup and say, why didn't we start these medications a long time ago? La, 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 la. So these are just real conversations that happen sure. with patients. And um, that's why we do this program. Okay, continue. And then there are newer classes of medications, and some of them work better in combination. The, the th tricky thing about prostates is, is you don't always just focus on the treatment of the prostate itself and the enlargement, but sometimes that enlargement can cause side effects to the bladder and the way the bladder behaves. So you have to treat maybe the bladder becomes overactive and they've got a lot of urinary frequency where they're going every 10 to 15 minutes or a lot of urinary urgency where they got to go and they got to get there right away or they'll start leaking urine. And so sometimes your medication therapy has to be tailored to treat not just the prostate, but the downstream consequences of what the prostate's done to the bladder. Now, do these medications just help you urinate better or do they, can they actually shrink the prostate? So one class of medications in particular can help shrink the prostate. Um, that's called Proscar. It's a 5-alpha reductase inhibitor. It's the same medication we use to grow hair. Um, and what it does is it prevents the conversion of testosterone to dihydroepitestosterone only in the prostate and at hair follicles. So what that will do is it will shrink the prostate and it will also decrease the PSA. Okay, no, no, that's, a, that's called Proscar. Proscar or Finasteride. Okay, is that the same as Flomax? No, Flomax is an alpha blocker, which basically the prostate has smooth muscle in it and that Flomax will relax that smooth muscle to open up the channel. You'll see an effect from Flomax within 7 to 14 days, where with the Proscar, you may not see an effect because it works through a hormonal pathway for 4 to 6 weeks, and you may not see the maximum effect for up to 6 months. And does the Proscar call, cause retrograde ejaculation? All the medications have the ability to cause retrograde ejaculation. Would surgery be a better option? With these side effects of the medication, it seems like maybe. 
So depending on the prostate and their symptoms and the severity of their symptoms, you may want to consider surgery earlier than the medication treatments, especially if that patient has what's called a median lobe where that prostate grows into the bladder and acts like a flap valve to block the channel. Medications are not very effective in treating that particular situation, in which case surgery is going to be much more efficacious for those patients. What's happening during the surgery? What are you doing? So it depends on what surgery we're talking about, and and that's where BPH gets very confusing because there's a spectrum of treatments, and it goes everywhere from very lowly invasive to maximally invasive and minimally effective to maximally effective. And so we have these minimally invasive surgical therapies, which are office-based therapies, things that you may hear in the common part called Urolift, which is a device that you implant and opens up the channel. Um, there's something called resume or steam therapy to create scarring within the prostate to open up that channel. Um, if you can think about it, people have done it to the prostate. But the more effective the surgery, the more you of that tissue you remove, the longer the results are going to be, the less the retreatment is going to be. What's the surgery that the guys are telling each other, you need to go see my guy and have this done? That's the holup, okay. the homium laser enucleation of the prostate. And that's what gets us back to that orange model. When you think about the orange and the orange peel, what we're able to do without making any incisions in the body is we go and we peel the meat of the orange away, push it into the bladder so that small channel through the prostate becomes a wide open, almost cavern or cistern. And then we put another instrument in there called a morselator, which morselates all that tissue up and pulls it out. The advantage of that is one, the tissue we get out, we're able to look at under the microscope to make sure there is no prosthetic disease, such as prostate cancer or things like that. Even though a minimal amount of prostate cancer grows in the center part of the prostate, while the majority grows in that orange peel, um, but we're able to remove the catheter on the same day or the next day, and they're able to get back to their normal activities in seven to 10 days. So men really appreciate any kind of procedure where they can come in, they can leave the same day or the next day, they don't have to make friends with their Foley catheter. And then they can get back to all their normal activities in seven to ten days without worrying about bleeding or things like that. And their and the retreatment rate on that is less than one percent. So it becomes a lifelong solution for them. No more need to take medications. They don't have to spend the money. They don't have to take the time with it. And it's a permanent solution for them. You have to be pretty skilled to do this operation, don't you? I mean, not all urologists do this. It's probably one of the most difficult surgeries in all of urology, uh, just because you have to take a two-dimensional object and translate it into three dimensions. Once you learn how to do it, it's not challenging. But being able to identify the planes and things like that, there's probably about 25 centers in the United States that do it. At Mayo Clinic, probably has the highest expense, uh, experience in the United States where you've done about over 2,500 personally just in Arizona. So you have done 25. I've done over 2,500 in Arizona. Are you making 3D models of their particular prostate, or is that going overboard to prepare for each surgery? No. After 2,500, you pretty much, there's not much the prostate can throw at you. Um, so we don't use models. It's all about the identification of the surgical plane. That's where the challenge is. And then it's all about, after that, efficiency. The nice thing about this procedure is the laser is so hemostatic. So even if they're on an anticoagulation like aspirin or something that they need to be on for some other health reason, you're able to take care of that prostate. The other nice thing about the holop is there's no size restriction. You can do small prostates, medium-sized prostates, big prostates. Small prostates are probably the most challenging, and I would say those are probably the ones that don't need this procedure. But once they're over a certain size, and most prostates normally are 20 to 40 grams. Prostates, anything greater than 80 grams is considered a large prostate. The average prostate I see in my practice is about 150, and the biggest prostate I've done with the hole-up technique was about 770. That's is about an orange. Uh, it's oh. about a sack of oranges. It was it was a big one. <laughs> do oh they do gosh. this procedure at all three sites, all three Mayo Clinic sites? Uh, yes. So they've got somebody in Jacksonville doing it. Um, they had somebody here in Rochester doing it, but they don't currently uh, right now. I was up here before um, teaching somebody in Rochester to do it, but right now they're looking to fill that position right now. All right. Arizona in the winter, looks like. June is Men's Health Month, and there's a reason to raise awareness of preventable health problems in men and also to make an early diagnosis and get treatment started as early as possible. Women live five years longer, and they go to the doctor much more often than do men. Men, we need to take a lesson from the women of the world. And we've talked about benign prostatic hyperplasia or hypertrophy, enlargement of the prostate. Most men can get by with medication, but there are surgical options available. And it sounds like, would you say the HOLA procedure is now the gold standard? 
It is the gold standard. The only thing that keeps it from being the gold standard is not enough people know how to do it. But the outcomes, the patient outcomes, the less risk, the easier recovery, hold it by far, and the literature supported it uh, all the time over any other potential treatment. You better get home because there's probably a lineup of men waiting for having you take care of their prostate. Our thanks to urologist Dr. Mitchell Humphreys from the Mayo Clinic in Arizona.